evening, friends. Shall we bow our heads and speak to the King of Kings for service? Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee tonight for the grand privilege that we have of coming together and meeting, worshiping Thee in spirit and truth. We thank Thee for the Lord Jesus, for His great redeeming love to us that was so sovereignly given. And when we were sinners, away from God, alienated, without hope, without God, Christ died, the lovely for the unlovely, to redeem us back to the Father. And now, brought us so close that we're recognized as sons and daughters of God. But it has not yet appeared what we shall be in the final end. But we know that we'll have a body like his own glorious body, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. Glory to God. Then, Lord, there'll be no more prayer for the sick. Amen. It'll all be over then. So help us tonight to worship him. All that is within us and bless the Lord. For we ask that in the name of Jesus, God's beloved Son, Amen. Amen. Good evening, friends, and I'm so happy to be with you again this evening to worship our dear blessed Savior. <clears throat> if Dr. Lee Vale, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Ohio, if he will see my boy Billy Paul behind the stage, uh, right away, if you will, Dr. Vail. Now we have one more night after tonight of this lovely uh, gathering here in the great Cato Tabernacle. And we're so happy to be here and for our open door to meet together, worship the Lord. And the Lord has been blessing us tremendously, I feel. Yes. And this great convention that has come to Indianapolis, and I am so happy that they invited me to have a part of this convention to speak to you the purchase of the blood of the Lord Jesus. I've often wondered what I would do if I had two drops of the literal blood of Christ that I could hold in my hand in a charger, how I would walk with it so carefully that I would not spill it. But I think tonight I have in his sight greater than two drops of the literal blood. I have the purchase of his blood before me. So I'm very careful of what I say to the purchase of his blood. So it was, it's our intention to try to help further the cause of Christ and make people, the world, as Mr. Cadle used to say it here at the Tabernacle, a better place to do, easier to do right and harder to do wrong, something on that order. And many of you have heard the brothers say that. And we're thinking tonight that he is a place where there will never be no more wrong in glory. The Bible said they rest from their labor, but their works do follow them. Amen. And that is right. The Lord bless this work. Mr. Ford had just had the privilege of meeting just a few moments ago. Very fine Christian gentleman. So glad that Indianapolis has a place like this. So now, tonight we are back over in the blessed old Bible. That's just about all I know about it. And my ABCs. How many know what the ABCs of the Bible is? Always believe Christ. <laughs> that's, that's the ABCs of the Bible. So last evening we was trying to speak on Abraham. And I got part of the way through to my text and we had to hurry. So I thought maybe tonight I'd finish it up and give us a chance to dismiss a little earlier and maybe tomorrow night being the great press, tomorrow night is the closing of this convention. And usually on that night, there's more takes place than any other night because it's the, the pressure, the anticipation. Yes. 
and many times as far as the healing that they press hard and they know they've got to have faith right now or not have it at all so they press right up and usually our Lord does great things for us so we're expecting tomorrow night and will you pray with me that there will not be one sick or feeble person left among us uh, will you hold on to God for that for me tomorrow night and I know that he was wounded for our transgressions and with his stripes we were healed someone not long ago was discussing it with me and a very fine scholar and he could speak words that I know nothing about and so he said brother Branham I believe you're sincere but said I'm sure that you're wrong when you teach divine healing because you can't place divine healing in the atonement he said do you preach divine healing from the atonement I said every redemptive blessing is by the atonement and he said well, if I'll prove to you that it isn't in the atonement. I said, well, uh, I would sure like to hear it. And he said, you preach what Isaiah said about Christ, uh, bore our infirmities and so forth. I said, yes, sir. That's. He said, if I'll prove to you that that was fulfilled, will you accept it? I said, if it's proved by the Bible, uh, I will. And I knew him just fresh from school, and I, I, I never went any farther than seventh grade, so I know it was more than a match for me and, and wits like that, but I know who I have believed, see, the Lord Jesus. And I know that he's a healer, because he healed me. I was blind, and now I see. So I, I know he's the healer, and I've seen him heal tens of thousands of people are seeing people accept their healing. That's the way it is. It isn't, the Lord doesn't heal you now. He's already done it. Every redemptive blessing has already been finished at Calvary. You just look and live. That's the way it is. It's not that anybody can heal you or bring healing or God bring any healing. It's your faith in His finished work. So He said it wasn't finished there at Calvary for healing. He said now, in Matthew the 8th chapter, I believe it is, He said, Mr. Brandon, he said, the Bible said that he healed the people that was brought to him that it might fulfill, which is spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He bore our infirmities and so forth. I said, do you apply it there, brother? He said, yes. I said, how could that be the atonement when it was a year and six months before the atonement was ever made? He hadn't yet been glorified. The blood had never been shed. So if that be the case, the atonement had more power before it was actually in force than it did after it's in force. So how could we do that? I said, that was about a year and six months before he was crucified. The blood had never been shed yet. So how could that apply to the atonement? And uh, so then he went to use the great big words and I said, kind sir, I don't have the gift of interpretation. <laughs> I said, I, I, I can't understand what you're talking about. Just plain King James. <laughs> I'll understand it better. So I said, well, let's, he kept talking. I said, well, now, brother, look, I'm going to ask you something. Will you admit that divine healing is in the Word? Well, Mark 11, 24 said, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe, see. Oh, he said, yes. And I, he said the wrong thing there. He said, uh, it was in the Word, because whatsoever, I said, Jesus said, whatsoever things, and the things that I do shall you also. What about that? And he said, uh, well, you're trying to run off on Mark 16. I said, no, sir, I I'm trying to get you to Mark 11. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, I said, he said, yes, it's in the Word, but, but not in the atonement. Well, I said, the Word's over the atonement. Oh, he said, it can't be. I said, it is. And I said, look, there was a king one time that made all of his laws and rules. And uh, he had, uh, he made all the laws and the penalties. He was a just man. He was a truthful man. And one time there was a slave committed a crime at the judgment seat. The king said, I'm sorry, sir. But I have to take your life because it's written right here in my laws that you have to die for this penalty. 
And I'm a, a man that's just. I can't go back on my word. And here is my law says that you must die. So I have to take your life. And the poor fellow started trembling. He said, well, what can I do for you before I take your life? He said, give me a glass of water. He took the glass of water and he couldn't hold it. He didn't know his head was going to be cut off. And he just shake it. He said, now wait a minute. He said, I'm not going to take your life till you drink the water. The slave threw it on the ground. <laughs> I said, what's he going to do now? Is his word above his life? He has to stay with his word if he's just. He said, that was a slip up on the king. I said, then God would put it in his word, not in the atonement. He'd have to slip up too. Not our God. He don't have no slip ups. <laughs> That's right. He doesn't. A lady, here some time ago, uh, sent her boy away to school to learn to be a minister. So she'd taken real sick and she sent to the school and said for the boy to stand by for the doctor who said she might die. It was She had pneumonia in the worst stage. So the boy made ready to come home on a moment's call. And so he didn't hear no more. He said the next day his mother was all right, so he let it go. So when he come home on a vacation, he said to his mother, he said, Mother, said, what happened to you when you were so sick and you got well so quick? He said, what doctor did you see? She said, hallelujah, Jesus. He said, Mother. She said, you know... There's a, you know how little mission is around the corner? I said, yes. I said, well, there was one of those ladies down there come up to see me. I said she was led to come see me. And my doctor had given me up and said, down at our church, we pray for the sick and anoint them with oil and pray for the sick. And said, would you let our pastor come pray for us? She said, well, I'd be glad. So he said, went and got the pastor and come up. And he read out of the Bible in Mark, the 16th chapter, where if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And said, the minister read that to me out of the Bible and laid hands on me. And I got well. Oh, he said, ridiculous, mother. Ridiculous. So that's just the uneducated people believe that. So now in the seminary, we learn that Mark, the 16th chapter from the ninth verse on is not inspired. And the woman said, Hallelujah. Why well, said mother, the very audacity was well, said, you act like one of them down there. So she said, Hallelujah. He said, What's the matter with you? He said, I was just a thinking. If God could heal me with uninspired word, what could he do with that really is inspired? As Billy Sunday once said, the argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken and starved to death. So it's very thin against divine healing because just a little too late, God's already doing it. So that, the proof of the pudding is the eating there, Hal. <laughs> well, over in this blessed old Bible, or the old textbook, we'll take the same subject tonight of Abraham and tomorrow night. Remember, come early and we're going to have the boys giving out their cards and things early if we can for a great prayer line tomorrow night, the Lord willing. Now, last night we left off where Abraham, I believe, had went up and God had taken him out of the picture, showing that his covenant was holy. Uh, it was no strings tied to it. It was... God, by His sovereign grace, had promised unconditionally that He would save Abraham and his seed. And we found out last night in the reading of the Word that we are Abraham's seed when we are dead in Christ and are heirs of the same promise. Is that right? Abraham's seed. Every man that's born of the Spirit of God is Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. Paul said we are Jews, uh, not Jews outwardly, but Jews inwardly. Now, the promise was to the seed, not seeds of Abraham. Abraham had several sons. But only one through Sarah was the promise. 
And uh, Abraham believed God, how he got this great name of being the father of nations. He believed God and believed in hope. Against hope, he still believed in hope, knowing that God was able to perform what he had promised. Oh, my young brother sitting there in a wheelchair. If you could only see that promise tonight, sonny boy. Calvary's before you. And if you could just move the shadows from your mind, look there, something to anchor down in here, there would be nothing in the world ever moving. You'd be pushing that wheelchair out the building and around the Cato Tabernacle, the place where you come from. And you that's dying with heart trouble, worst killer there is. Cancer. Doctors can hardly do a thing about it. I heard on the radio the other day that it couldn't be proved that one time an operation for cancer was ever successful. They call it a fourth dimension disease. But God's got the cure. <laughs> Medicine is remedies. God is the cure. I'm the Lord that healeth all of thy diseases. Now, if Abraham believed God because God said so, then we being Abraham's seed, we have the same type of faith Abraham had. Because God called Abraham by election. How did he call you? By election. The only way you could be called is by election. No man can come to me except my father calls him first. God does the electing. Then you just follow and then if he called you and all that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life and will no wise cast him out and raise him up at the last day. Those who he foreknew, he has called. Those who he has called, he justified. Those who he justified, he hath glorified. That's God's word. I love it. Because I can put my confidence in it and believe it and know that it's the truth. I just made a remark a few moments ago. In my travels around the world, I find two classes of people. Two churches as to speak. There's only one church, but this is what I mean. I find the fundamental people who positionally know what they are in Christ Jesus... But I say this with reverence. They don't have much faith in what they believe. Now, then the next class is a Pentecostal. They got a lot of faith, but don't know who they are. That's it. Now, it's just like a man's got money in a bank, and he doesn't know how to write a check. And next man can write a check, but he hasn't got no money in the bank. <laughs> If you could ever get them two together, you would have it. If I could get Pentecostal faith and fundamental doctrine, or get fundamental doctrine and Pentecostal faith, the millennium would start right away. There would be something wonderful. But the Pentecostal people, uh, with respect to knowing that probably 80% of this crowd is Pentecostal, lovely people, but you, you shout all your joy away. You shout all your faith away if you take that and place it solemnly and what God said and know that's what is making you happy and know that what gives you redemption, which you're happy about and you should be. If you'd use that faith under Calvary and take God and say, it's you, Lord, and there isn't one speck of me that doubts it. Things that take place. There's an intellectual faith. We are a trinity like God is. In our soul, body, and spirit. Now, the science said a few years ago that when God said that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. They said that God didn't know what he was talking about. And when the Bible said your, your body's full of light, the old scientist said, oh, isn't that crazy, the infidel? But look, God proves that your body's full of light. The x-ray proves that. It's your own light meters in your body. Not the light of the x-ray. It has no light. It's your light meters that takes the, makes the x-ray. So your body is full of light. And then every little cell is a light cell in there. 
Now, also, listen. Here, about two years ago, I was in Chicago, where science has proved now, just about a year and six months ago, I guess it was, they had a piece of paper, Mr. Bolze's daughter and I were reading it, that where, that the doctors has proved that inside of the heart of a human, not an animal, in a human is a teeny little compartment, little bitty compartment that doesn't even have a blood cell in it. And they say it's the aqua of the soul. The soul lives in the heart. Now, intellectual faith is what, that's what's the matter with our revivals today. Now, here it is now, get it. Billy Graham, Jack Schuler, many a great man, Oil Roberts, great evangelists on the fields, has combed this nation back and forth. Alder calls has been made to enough to convert a thousand Americans, or Americas rather. But the reason, it's only the people who are brought to an intellectual faith. If they would go on just a little deeper to let faith come from the intellectuals and soak down into the soul, it would last. That's the reason about 80% or 90% of the converts that comes in a revival is gone before six months is gone. Is because they only have an intellectual conception. But when it becomes an experience of being born again of the Spirit of God, that anchors to eternity. Amen. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed until the next revival. <laughs> I just want to see if you listen to what I was talking about. <laughs> Amen. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed. How long? That's right. No breaking the seal when a, a building is completely or a boxcar, I'd say, loaded and the seal put on it. Don't you never touch that seal. You're in trouble with the government. And when God cleanses out by grace all the unbelief out of the heart where a man can look God in the face and realize that he's an offspring of God. He'll believe every word that God wrote in that Bible to be the truth. God will seal him into the kingdom of God by the Holy Ghost until the day of his redemption. God said so. I believe the word. One great neglect among us. One great thing that we don't have. Much of is the anemic condition of the church. The condition that the church... Uh, is failing, and here's now. Here's one thing we go too much upon evidences. Now, Luther said, The just shall live by faith. He thought he had. Wesley said, When you've got enough salvation, get sanctified. Now, you good Methodist, that's pretty good. <laughs> when you've got enough faith to sanctify and get the shouting, Nazarenes, Pilgrim Holiness. Methodist, you said, glory, we got it. But you found out you didn't. That's right. You've done a lot of things after you shouted you oughtn't have done. Backslid, went on back. You Pentecostal, got to speaking in tongues. You said, oh, brother, we got it now. But you find out you didn't. God is love. And the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, mercy. Where there's knowledge, it shall vanish. Educate your preachers as much as you want to. Where it'll, knowledge, it'll vanish. Where there's prophecies, it'll fail. Where there's tongues, they shall cease. But when that which is perfect is come, which is love, it endureth forever. Amen. Let me stop here just a moment. we got plenty of time tonight anyhow. I'll get to this text tomorrow night maybe then. Let me just give you a little inside of my life. Would you like to know it just a little bit? I don't like just to hear just something comes in nice. I'm going to tell you, my brethren, no make endeavors high emotional you try to be. That's good. Anything without emotion is dead. You can scientifically prove that. So if your religion ain't got a little emotion about it, you better bear it. <laughs> Get something that's got emotion. Amen. But look, brother, the main thing of all of your emotions isn't 
sealed by divine Holy Spirit love, it won't do you any good. You know how I've had success? This one thing I contribute, love. That's right. You know, love will conquer anything, no matter what it is. How many's read the book back there? I've been reading my book. Let's see your hands. How many's ever read my book? Fine, thank you. You've seen the picture of the angel of the Lord back there, too. Now notice, all scientifically, you notice in the first part at Portland, Oregon that night when I was standing on the platform, and that maniac run to the platform to kill me. You remember reading that? I was just speaking, just like I am now. And this fellow run down to a crowd of people, of thousands, and they were standing in the street. And his eyes bulged way out, and he was making his hands go up and down. He ran up to the platform. I thought maybe somebody was sick, and he was coming after his about 150, 200 ministers sitting behind me. And I looked at him, and he ran run up that way, and preachers scattered like flies. <laughs> and I... He just hit a preacher that day and his Ivy Insane Institution broke his jaw and his collarbone. The police was after him. And up the platform, he run right straight up to me and blowed real big like a goose. Pushed out his chest, great big arms. I weighed 128 then. He weighed about 250. About six foot tall, better, less six foot and four inches or something. And he said, you hypocrite, you snake in the grass, standing up here imposing yourself as a servant of God, I'm going to take you apart right on this platform. Well, uh, you better know what you're talking about when it's a maniac. I just kept still, looked at him. He said, calling yourself a man of God, rolled his arm up. Said, I'm going to knock that little frame of yours come out of that audience and won't be a piece of you together when you land. I know he was well able to carry his threats out. I just looked at him. Not a preacher said a word. They were gone. And I looked, and here come two police. I just led both of them to Christ. One of their mothers was healed the night before. A good Presbyterian woman. And they run out there to grab him. I said, this is not a flesh and blood affair, brother. Just a moment. Thank you. The little fellows backed off, stood there a minute. I just kept real still. And I was going to tell him, I say, sir, what's the matter? And he went, <laughs> spit right in my face. And he said, you snake in the grass. He said, tonight I'm going to break every bone in your body. And I was going to say, I hope you don't. And as I started to say that, God in his sovereignty... The Holy Spirit came down and he said, just spoke in my eye. They thought it was me speaking, but it wasn't. No more than it is in the vision. He said, because that you've challenged the Spirit of God, tonight you'll fall over my feet. There's both prophecies. Now it had to be shown. He said, fall over your feet, said you hypocrite. He said, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over it drew back his arm and run at me real hard and started to hit at me. I said, Satan, come out of the man. And when his arm was up, he went, hmm, hmm, rolled around like that and fell down across my feet and pinned me there to the police. Had to roll him off of my feet. They said, is that man dead? I said, no, sir. He worships that spirit. They pulled him out. <laughs> what was it? Did I hate that man? I loved him. A poor mortal. In that condition, that wasn't that man speaking, that was the devil. He was possessed of the devil. And the devil made the challenge and the Holy Spirit challenged him back. And you know what happened? There was wheelchairs, cot stretchers, you know how it was in the first beginning. When that happened, you could, when he was speaking, you could have heard a pin drop, as the old saying is. But when the, all that legion saw that their chief man had been slain, every sick person rose to their feet, every cop was empty, every wheelchair emptied up, and the whole group was healed at one time. They walked out. Because the power of hatred and the power of love 
had met together and love will overcome hatred every time. Love your enemy. I, you might, I hope you don't dislike me from this song, but I want to tell you a little something happened. You might say after this, Brother Branham is a fanatic, but all right, you're going to say it anyhow, so you might as well say something more. So then, one day down on the Burke's farm down in Indiana here, where I come from, Jeffersonville, there'd been a big old bull had killed a colored man. They sold him out there near Henryville. Big Guernsey bull. Great long horns. I was game warden here for years when I was a Baptist minister. I just uh, used to patrol. I never taken an offering in my life. Never took one offering in my life. So a brother asked me one time if I'd take him an offering. I said, you'll starve next week. <laughs> well, I remember one time I said I was going to take an offering in my church. And uh, I told my wife we got to a place where we couldn't make ends meet. Did you ever get them places? Sure you have. <laughs> And I said, honey, I'm going to take an offering tonight. She said, I'm going over to watch you. So I got up there and I said, now, not because they wouldn't, they'd give me anything they had, but I was young and why couldn't I work the same as anyone else? So I got up and I said, brother, I, <clears throat> we didn't even have a collection plate. I said, I, I'm going to hit a little tough place. I'm going to take an offering tonight. I said, would some of you get my hat? And one of the old deacons walked over and get my hat. I looked down at a little old mother sitting there under her little checkered apron. I don't know where you ever seen the pocket on the inside of the apron. She reached down there and got out one of those uh, doing time of the depression anyhow, you know, and a little old pocket book of snaps over the top, beginning to fumble around them nickels at home. I, I couldn't stand it. Oh, I said, I was just a tease. You know, I didn't mean that. That's the closest I ever come to taking it off. And... Mr. Ryan, an old fellow, come down from Wall Jack, Michigan, had long hair, rode a bicycle down there, and he'd give it to me, and I got a 10 cent can of paint and painted it and sold it for $5, and then I picked the offering in for all. So that was it. I was patrolling, and I was in the conservation, and I've been over there to a, a creek, and I remember a brother was across the other side, was sick, and had sent for me to come over and have prayer for him. I just thought this was a good time, so I started walking up over the hill. A little brush in the field like. And when I got about middle ways of this field of about 500 yards across there or more, what raised up but that same bull that had killed that colored man. And there he was standing about 30 or 40 feet from me. And he, he and some cows was laying there. He raised up and snorted and looked at me and I recognized the bull. Well, I supposed I have a gun, but <laughs> I didn't have one. And so I looked back to the fence, it's too far to run, and no tree to get into. So I thought, this is probably the end then. So I looked at him, and you know, uh, this is not a joke. When I looked at that bull, and he lowered his head into his horns on the ground, threw the dirt back over him, and he started to me. Now, instead of hating that bull, I was glad I didn't have no gun. I loved him. Now, that seems strange. I, I want you to remember this. I love that fellow. I thought, poor fellow. I'm in his place. I'm on his territory. He's sleeping, and I woke him up. Just got him roused up. And I said to him, not knowing, I said, creature of God, I am the servant of God. I'm on my way to pray for one of God's sick children. Now, you can't bother me because I'm God's servant. Now, I'm sorry I disturbed you. In Jesus' name, go lay down. And that bull, not a bit more afraid of that bull than I was the man that night or my brethren sitting here. And that bull ran right to me till he got within about 10 feet of me. And I wasn't more afraid than I am now. And he got right close to me and he stopped. And he looked this way and that way, so depleted. And I just looked at him and thought, poor fellow. He turned right around, walked over and laid down. I walked right on by him. <laughs> Love will conquer anything. Where there's tongues, they shall cease. Where there's prophecies, it shall vanish. But when love comes, it conquers everything. God so loved the world. That's where you're failing, friends. Don't practice so much of whether you got gifts or not, but practice that one real gift of love, and you'll be better. Then I started this far, I might as well say something else. Many of you come down and be prayed for at the house, and I, one, I was trying to mow my yard, and the front, and 
And I'd mow a couple of rounds and run, a carload of people come in and be praying for him. I'd run around and take off my overalls and, and put on my other clothes and go and pray for him. And while the front was growing up before I'd get the back. Uh, so um, I was down in the backyard, no one back there, and I took off my shirt real hot. And I was mowing with the mower just as hard as I could. Never thought, but there's a big old hornet's nest hanging in the corner. And I hit the fence, and brother, sister, Jehovah God, knowing all things in me in this sacred desk here, I was covered over in a moment with hornets. Instead of hating those hornets, I thought, poor little fellows. I, I disturbed them. That's their home. God made them. Amen. And I, I, that's their home. That's and I said, a little creatures of God, I'm sorry I disturbed you. But now I'm the servant of God and I'm in a hurry. There's many of his sick children coming here to be prayed for. I must hurry. And I run that lawnmower back and forth. And those harness humming all around me with no shirt on, they'll kill you. One of them will knock you down. Great big fellows. And they, them harness flew all around me. And I just went right on mowing with just the love of them poor little things. And they circled right around and went right straight into that nest in a straight row. Right like that. In the name of the Lord Jesus. What is it? Love conquers all things. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And faith will accompany that love. Now, notice, Abraham had to believe God in order, love God, to believe Him. You love him, and more you love him, the more faith will accumulate. And so last night we left him where he was appeared to Abraham at 90 years old as Almighty God, the breast, El Shaddai. Now we find out after he had been El Shaddai to Abraham, Abraham, an old man, still believing, holding on to the promise, lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of every promise of God and hold on to it. That's what he said about being El Shaddai. The baby just lays hold of the mother's breast. And satisfied as he nurses the strength of the mother into his own body. And he's nursing the mother's strength in his own body. If he's weak, fretty, run down, he nurses the mother's strength. Now... God's Word is His breast. And we just lay hold of that and nurse our strength back from God's promise. Just keep quoting it over. I'm the Lord that healeth thee. Oh, what a change it makes when you believe it. Now, we find that Abraham then Lot separated himself from him and got into trouble and a beautiful picture here, I want you to sit, of God's love, Christ going after the backslider and the sinner. King's enemies come in and tuck Lot, wife, tuck the kings of Sodom, and went out. And Abraham, as soon as he learned that his nephew Lot had been taken by the enemy, look at it. Abraham got all of his servants together. And went pursuing the enemy and captured the enemy and brought Lot back. What a picture of we fallen race of Adams. The enemy had us and God, the Father, took the host of heaven and went pursuing the devil until he conquered him. And brought us back safely. What a picture of salvation. God, wish we had a long time. Wish we this revival could go on for about two weeks so we could just get right in this word and go to digging in it. Bringing faith. Got a big tent coming. Seeking about 12,000. We're going to put it up and stay four or six weeks at a time. So we can just keep on. And now... Notice another thing after that, then, after this destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we had to pass over many of these great places. And then when we find then the next thing takes place, 
that Abraham is setting out in the barren land. God has not promised us everything nice, but God's promised grace to endure. God's not promised to take us home on a flower bed of ease. Look at the patience of Job and the disciples and down through the age how men and women have suffered for the cause of Christ. And here was Abraham sitting up on the barren grounds under his oak, his little tent, the flock being very poor because Lot had taken the choice grounds. And he and Sarah was sitting there in one afternoon while Abraham looked out, yet holding on to God's promise. He looked standing near the tree. There stood three men over against him. Abraham went out to him, fell down at his feet, the three men, and said, If I have found grace in thy sight, stop by just a moment, sit under the oak or the tree, the shade is hot today. Courtesy. Said, and I'll fetch a little water and wash your feet. And I'll have a morsel of bread cooked for you. And you refresh yourself and then you may go on. That's the way to entertain strangers. Notice Abraham waiting for the promise. There was something in him that recognized that those were more than man. For one of them was Almighty God Himself. And the other was two angels. The other two. And so he slipped into the tent right quick and said, Sarah, go over to the meal barrel and get some meal and knead it right quick or sift it out and make some unleavened cakes right quick. And he run out into the herd and fell around till he got the fattest calf he had. Churned some milk right quick and got some butter. Killed the calf and cooked it and got some veal chops, cornbread, some butter, the buttermilk, took it out and set it down for God and two angels to eat. Amen. Oh my, I feel religious right now. Think of that. God visiting mortal man. Oh, that kind of makes the little wheels go to turning. Look at it. Now, Abraham sat and watched him. Probably got him a little bush and shooting the flies away while they were eating. Did you ever do that? We used to have to do it at home. Have a little fly bush out in the country. Before we had screen doors, we could afford them. And there, he watched the angels and God while they were eating. And God had his back turned to the door. He said, Abraham... Where's Sarah? Said she's in the tent. He said, about this time, according to life, I'm going to, the time of life, I'm going to visit you. Sarah, nearly 100 years old. Said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah, here it is, now watch. Sarah, in the tent, laughed. (laughs) Inside the tent, at God's back, the man sitting there. Human flesh, eating the meat of a calf, drinking the milk and butter from the cow, eating some cornbread. And he said, why did Sarah laugh? Back behind him. What would some of you skeptics call that? Mental telepathy? (laughs) Reading the mind of Sarah? Anyhow, God did it. Sarah got scared. She said, no, I, I never left. I said, oh, yes, you did, too. He knew what it was talk, what he was talking about. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? The Word, so real and so simple. After eating, he said, would I keep a secret from Abraham? Let him know what I'm going to do? And he revealed to him that the sins of Sodom had already reached heaven. Their cries were great. He's going down to destroy it. Think of it. That, and then he went up, vanished from Abraham. The angels went on. All, a preacher said to me some time ago, he said, Brother Branham, do you really say that was God? I said, it ain't whether I said it or not. The Word said it. Amen. 
And watch it's in capital L-O-R-D. Rulership. Heavens and earth. Lord God. Why, well, I said, how could that happen? Why, well, I said, you limit God to your theology. Some people just can't. We may not be able to shout down the walls of Jericho. Or we might not be able to have the faith of Joshua to cross the Jordan. And we may not have the faith like Enoch did, who taken a little walk one day with God in the afternoon, a little stroll, and just got tired of the earth and walked on home with him. God is almighty. So what is the body made of? A little calcium, potash. Here some time ago down in Memphis, Tennessee, I like art. And I was watching there in a museum where it said the analysis of the human body of a man weighing 150 pounds was worth 84 cents. There's enough whitewash in the body to sprinkle a hen's nest and, oh, you know, just a few things like that. These two boys stand there. They, one looked around and said, well, John, we're not worth very much, are we? <laughs> but you'll put a $500 mink coat on that 84 cents and walk down the street with your nose turned up like if it rained, it would drown you. And you belong to some big church and you take care of that 84 cents. And what is it? Nothing but a little handful of ashes. And you'll stick anything in that soul which is worth 10,000 worlds. You don't think about that. Thus thy art, dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Yes. 84 cents, what the human bodies were. God just reached down and got a handful of atoms and a handful of calcium and a handful of cosmic light and just blowed it together and made three bodies and him and two angels stepped down in it. And they eat. That's our God. What do you, what's the resurrection source of mystery about then? If the God who can come out of all space, who fills the space of the solar system and beyond. Amen. Why, well, it's nothing for him to speak and anything can happen. And if he knows you by name, look, as I said the other night about what my wife told me, I was getting bald-headed. And I told her I hadn't lost one of my hairs. She said, where are they at? I said, where was he before I got them? They are there waiting for me to come to them. And so is this body going away. But one day there won't be a speck of it left, but every atom is holding together. Every bit of petroleum, all the cosmic light. God had it when he made the world and he'll give it back in an immortal condition at the day of the resurrection when he calls from the dead. Amen. So what you scared about? You should be the happiest people on earth. My God who controls all the elements. They're all his. He created them first before he created you. You're just a part of his creation when he made all those things. Then he just took a little bit of it and formed it and made you. Now, notice, God was showing in Sarah and Abraham there something that he's going to do for all people. You believe that? This is just a little time out for a minute again. I want to ask you something. Dad, do you remember what mother looked like when you married her? You remember what dad looked like when you married him, mother? Fine looking, handsome man, and that hair combed back. How beautiful the eyes was of mother. You walk down to the altar, swallowing big and looking at her. I remember when I got married, I looked at my wife and my heart beating real fast. I couldn't, I was a little bashful, I couldn't ask her to marry me, so I wrote her a letter and asked her. And she accepted it. And <clears throat> so then when we. Remember when I got married, how pretty she was? But you know what? You wake up one morning and say, Mother, there's a wrinkle under them pretty eyes. Dad, there's some gray hairs coming in your head. Death set in. It's going to get you. God painted that picture and said, There they are. Aren't they beautiful? That's my handwork. Now, Death, come on. You can take the body. Look, now, Abraham and Sarah were old people. The Bible said they were well stricken in age. Now, what he proved through Abraham and what he did for Abraham and Sarah, he's going to do for all of Abraham's seed. Now, you have to read the Bible between the lines. Did you know that? 
That's where some of you smart scholars fail. That's right. He said, I've hid it from the eyes of wise and prudent and reveal it to babes such as will learn. Notice, just be a baby. Forget all you ever know to know Christ. And notice how my wife, when I'm overseas, she'll write me a letter and say, Dear Billy, I'm, here I am tonight. I'm thinking of you. Now, that's what she's putting on a paper, but I love her so much I can read between the lines. See? If you love God real well, this is all hid to the scholar, but you can read between the lines. It's a love letter. That's what I'm trying to tell you, love him. It's a love letter you read. God wrote to you. It's all hid from the smart people now. You just have to get simple to read it. That's right. Watch this just a moment. Maybe sometime coming back, I'd like to take this as love letter. May the Lord just reveal it to us, you know. So what? Abraham, you know what God did for Abraham and Sarah there? Might be strange, you might not think it. But he not only blessed them, but he turned them back to a young man and woman again. Did you know that? He did it. He sure did. Now watch. I can just imagine Abraham the next morning getting up and saying, Why, Sarah, you know what? Why, uh, Sarah, your your freckles are going out of your face. And she said, Well, Dad, look, look, you know what? That stoop in your shoulder's coming up. They were turning back. God can do all things. Watch. They left there and went down to Berea. Watch how far it is, about 300 miles. What a trip for an old age man, a little grandma with a little cap on her head, going, shaking along down the road. And now the strange thing was, when they got down there in the land of the Philistines, Amalek, the king, was hunting a sweetheart. And all those beautiful Philistine girls down there, when he seen Sarah, grandma, coming on a cane, he fell in love with her. <laughs> Nonsense. He said, that's the one I've been waiting for. Abraham said, oh, you're fair to look upon, Sarah, 100 years old. <laughs> See, you have to read between the lines. She was very fair. She went back to a young woman. Now, look, readers, you might criticize this. Now, look, if the woman was 100 years old, right on 100, God, she'd been barren all this time. God had to create something in her because her womb was dead. Is that right? If he did that, it's a mixed audience. I don't mean to be speaking like this. But in order for the woman to have the baby, in that time when the baby's being born, she'd have to have a new heart. That heart couldn't beat through that a woman 100 years old. There was no milk veins. She couldn't raise on a bottle. Women didn't smoke cigarettes and had to raise their babies on bottles and days. They had to raise it the, old, the real way. That's right. So, that's the truth. You know it's the truth. It's the, it's the biggest communistic. Why it's the worst? It's the most dirty thing you've ever done. A woman smoked cigarettes. I've got my opinion of her. Try. Right. I want to tell you something else. And I've got my opinion of a man that would let his wife smoke cigarettes. It shows who's the boss. Keep that for you. I didn't say that to be fraud. I don't mean it that way. I mean it the truth. It's a disgrace to see the way man so why they're sissy fighter more than her women are. Who rules around your house anyhow? That's right. Sarah was a beautiful now you ought to feel ashamed, lady. I'm watching whose face gets red. I'm up your way up high. I can watch it. It's by burn a little bit, but it'll be good for you. Notice. Sarah. Beautiful woman again. And Amalek fell in love with her. God had changed her. She's back to a young woman again. And Abraham showed it. They brought the baby forth. God did for them. She's back about 30 years old. And what he showed in Abraham and them, he proved what he's going to do for you and I someday. Amen. To those who will take his promise and call those things which are as though they was, if it's contrary to God's word. Amen. Believe God. Lay hold on it. Hold on to it. Set your course towards heaven. Look at Calvary. Author and finisher of our faith and not some scientific book. Notice. Look to Calvary. 
Watch just a minute now. Then talk about being a young woman. Sure she was. And Abraham a young man. Now look. They brought Isaac to the world. And when Isaac was a man of 45, Sarah died. And then Abraham married another woman. And I believe he had either seven or nine boys besides the girls after that. <laughs> Certainly he did. He turned him back to a young man again. That's God's word. I believe it. Yes, sir. Look at Abraham when he, he said it way down the line. When he was way down the line, before he was 145, when he was yet 80, he considered not his own body then dead. Oh, he's wonderful. Now, when the little boy was born, God proving after Abraham had held on for all these years, when he was about 12 years old, God said, now, Abraham, I'm going to show those Cato Tabernacle folks up there one of these days that I keep my promise and I'll show the world that you got faith in me. I want you, I've made you a father of many nations. And this boy in him, I'm going to call the seed from Isaac. And i say this, that I want you to take Isaac out there and kill him. The only hope that he had was in Isaac. So I imagine Abraham couldn't tell poor Sarah that. He's going to take this fine little 12-year, 14-year-old boy, his little curly hair hanging down around his shoulders, and the only child, and both of them then getting up to middle age again and... Well, how could they do it? Take that poor... He couldn't tell Sarah, so he got all the wood together, put it on a mule, got a couple of servants. And notice, he went three days' journey. And then he looked far off and he seen the mountain, which he was to go to to offer the Isaac for a sacrifice. Now, an ordinary man can walk anyhow 25 miles a day. I've walked 30 in many days. But ordinarily, in those, these days, when you go in your car everywhere you go, but them days they were used to walking, and if he went three days' journey, he was at least 75 miles back, and then he looked and saw the mountain far off, probably another 25 miles. Now he's 100 miles back from civilization. I love this. Genesis 22. Fix their clothes. Listen close. Then when he come close to the mountain, he said to the servants, he took the wood perfect type of Christ and God. He laid the wood on Isaac's shoulders, took the fire in his hand, and look at this now. Oh, I love this. Oh, he's wonderful. He said, you stay here. The lad and I are going yonder to worship. The lad and I shall return. Glory! I just had to let that come out. Look! How did he? The Bible said that he had received him as one from the dead, know that God could raise him up from the dead. How is he going to come back, Abraham? You're going up to kill him. How is he going to return with you? But he took God's word knowing that God had promised him that through Isaac, God is going to do something he didn't know what. But it wasn't his business to know what. It's walk on. There it is. How's God going to heal me? I don't know, but walk on. How am I going to tell my mother tonight that I got saved? I can't tell you. I'm going to tell my associates I received the Holy Spirit and born again. I can't tell you. Walk on. Just keep going. Move on. Laying aside everything. Moving on towards Calvary. On they went up the mountainside. The little boy with the wood on his shoulder, a type, God giving his only begotten son in shadow years to follow. But God showing in there what he would do. Oh, I just love it. And when he got up on top of the hill, he found a big rock for the altar, laid the wood, built the fire. 
Little Isaac said, Father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, here's the wood, here's the altar, here's the, here's the fire. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Oh, down that old patriarch's heart, trembling with a knife sticking on his side to take his own son's life. He said, God will provide himself a lamb for the offering. It's not my business to argue about it or this, that, or the other. God will provide. He made the promise. If he made the promise, how can I, Brother Branham, when I've been paralyzed in this hand? How can I, when I haven't seen for years? I don't know, but God made the promise. Oh, my. You get that down in your heart. Let your, your Abraham seed, let that faith come into you. Abraham seed. Notice. And he takes his little boy, binds his hands and his feet. Isaac never said a word. Obedient unto death, just like Jesus was at the cross. Laid him up on the altar, pulled out the knife, the tears may be rolling down his cheeks. Laid his hand on his little head, brushed back the curls, pulled back the knife like this, raised his hands to plunge the knife into his own son's throat. Because God had told him to do it just about the time he got ready to act upon God's commandments. The Holy Spirit grabbed his hand and said, Abraham, stay your hand. I know you love me. At that time, right over behind him, a ram hooked in the wilderness with his horns, bladed. Hallelujah. Oh, my Hallelujah means praise our God. What was it? Abraham loosed his son, went over and got this ram, and offered him instead. I want to ask you something, friends. He called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Where did that ram come from? He was a hundred miles from civilization. And besides that, the ram couldn't have been there. The wolves and lions and things would have eaten it. And another thing is up on top of the mountain. Where there's no water. Where did the ram come from? Jehovah Jireh. The creator spoke the lamb into existence. He is there at all times. He, that lamb come into existence in one minute and died the next minute. For one man taking God's word, God provided the thing. And he's still Jehovah tonight that will provide the sacrifice. And every time that a man or a woman will take his word and step out of it and call it the truth. I felt someone say it was a vision. It wasn't a vision. It was a ram. He laid it on the altar and killed it and blood ran out of it. It was a ram. God the Creator spoke it into existence. And He can do the same thing tonight. can speak into existence. The power and the operation of the Holy Ghost to transform a sinner into a saint. His omnipotence is here. His presence He's sure he's still Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. How can I be saved, Brother Branham, when I've done it? The Lord has provided. How can I be healed? The Lord has provided a ram. You believe it? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee tonight for all these marvelous examples. As Paul, the writer of the Hebrews, said, seeing it, we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Oh, God, let we tonight, living down in the closing of time, many thousands and innumerable miracles of God since that day upon the mount 
where Jehovah introduced himself as God's will provide. Thou hast provided us a Holy Spirit. Thou hast provided us healing. Thou hast provided us salvation. Thou hast provided us joy. God, with grasping arms, may we embrace every Calvary promise tonight as our own personal property. Grant it, Father. While we have our heads bowed, I just feel constrained to ask this question. You've been here many nights in a meeting. Are you without Christ, without God tonight, sinner friend? Would you just do this if you're convinced in your heart that he's provided a way for you to come out of that life and to live a different life? Are you convinced of it that he's here? If you are, will you just slip up your hand saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm now in my seat right here. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Will you raise your hand anywhere in the building? Say, God bless you, lady. Someone else? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Don't you know? Maybe, God bless you, lady. Maybe before morning, the doctor may come. Say, well, that's a heart attack. She's gone. He's gone. After leaving a meeting like this, where God comes every night and appears, God bless you back there, son. See your hands. God be merciful to me, sinner. I'll see you back there, son. God bless you, my brother. You say, well, that saved me. Yes, sir. Your faith in God's what saves you. I see you, mister. God bless your heart. I see your hand back here, sir. I see you, Larry, lady. God bless you. God bless you, lady. You, sir. God bless you. God bless you, sir. That's right. All over the buildings, hands going up. God bless you, lady. I see him with both stretched wide towards heaven. God be merciful to me. Provide. God bless you, little boy. I see you, honey. What did Jesus say? St. John 5, 24. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath eternal life and shall never come into judgment but has passed from death unto life. God bless you, sir. But doing that, if that comes below that hand from an honest heart, I believe it does, you have eternal life. All that my Father has given me will come to me, and no man can come except my Father draws it. And he that will come, I will no wise turn him out. I'll give him everlasting life and raise him up at the last day. What an easy thing it is just to renounce your sin. Raise your hand. I'm, people, don't be looking. Let God do the looking. Pray. God bless you, sir. God sees it. What is that? No man can come except my father draws him. What's that knock at your heart? Could you turn an opportunity like that down? Right here where you see God manifested every night? How wonderful it is. Just have faith. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. Someone else now. There's been many have wait. I see you, sir. God bless you, my brother. You were dead a few minutes ago, and now you're alive. I don't want to argue theology, but I'm saying what the Bible said. Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath, present tense, everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. You believe it with all your heart. Be like Abraham was. He believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, after he believed God and it was imputed to him, God gave him a sign of his faith. He gave him circumcision, which was a type of the Holy Ghost. After he has believed on God, been justified by faith, now he's to be sealed in the kingdom of God by the Holy Ghost. How many in here would, has never been sealed? God has never recognized your faith. You've never been born again, and he's never recognized, yet you've confessed it. But he's never given you the Holy Spirit, the new birth. Would you raise your hand and say, God, be merciful to me tonight? I won't. Oh, God bless you. That's wonderful. Just dozens of hands. Heavenly Father, you know from the greatest to the least of each of those... All those men and women, some young ladies and boys, just at the crossroads of life, raising their hands. What a beautiful sight. We know that the angels of God are around here now. They're standing near in the tabernacle. 
You've wrote down all these things which we'll have to come against us at the day of judgment if you knocked at our heart and we refused it. But all these hands has raised up that they have received you and they love you. And thou now, God, according to thy word, I commit them to thee. And thy word, Lord, said that if they would do that, believe it, accept it, that they'd have everlasting life and would not come to the judgment. But it's passed from death to life. We thank thee for them, Father. We pray that you'll gather them up around the altar and may they have a good refreshing from the presence of God. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I don't know how you feel, but I feel like something inside of me has been scoured out. It's like something had helped me. The, the sacred feeling of the Holy Spirit. Don't you feel that? That sacred feel. I just love that. There's something about the gospel that's cleansing. Souls being saved. It's late. I was just thinking about calling. I don't believe I'll call a prayer line. I believe we'll just stand right here. Just do what the Holy Spirit would have me do. Will you believe with me? Listen, your faith picked up last night. And just as I said that, something struck my heart, so that's it. You believe now. You have faith in God. Do you do it? Look, everyone out there, all you people out there, I don't know you. I've never seen you. Instead of you coming up here, it's just a recognition that God has provided a way to declare his word. You believe that? Now, Jesus is alive tonight, and he's among us. The very same God that created that lamb there for Abraham that took his word, he's sure to create for you anything that you ask him to do that's included in his blessings. Salvation, he did create for them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's created healing. It's already been finished at Calvary. You have to accept it. Now, let's bow our heads again just a minute. Would you give us, uh, Sister, ever who's playing there, just be real reverent. I want you to play for us. The great physician now is near. The sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping hearts to cheer. No other name like Jesus. His name expels my guilt and shame. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. He's here, the lovely one. Now, Heavenly Father, we're unworthy. We're just creatures of this earth, and we're unworthy of the things we ask for, but by grace thou hast overlooked our unworthiness. And we're not confessing that we are worthy. We're confessing we're unworthy. We do not ask for judgment. We ask for mercy. And dear God, the mercies of God to be granted to us tonight. Upon the condition of these people, or dozens of them has raised their hands to accept you as personal Savior. God, I'm asking you to do something. In this sovereignty of your gift, that ye, I, your unprofitable servant, and not saying that, Lord, be humble, thou knowest my heart. I'd be a hypocrite to say such a thing if it didn't come from my heart. Unworthy. But will you, by your sovereign grace tonight, just let the people have faith enough, like the woman at the well, and to prove to this audience that thy servant's words that I have said about your resurrection is true. Yes. Vindicate that to be truth tonight, won't you, God? Without even people close to me, will you grant that, Lord? Through Jesus Christ's name, I ask it. Amen. This is a strange thing. I don't say that God, our Father, will do it. I'm only asking for His mercy. Will you be in prayer just a few minutes? I want to ask you something. How many sick people is there in the building? Raise up your hands. Just how many sick people? Now, as a man, you have a right to doubt my word. But you don't have a right to doubt his word. You're a sinner when you doubt his word. Well, now, I've told you that Jesus raised from the dead and does the same things now that he did then. He stood in the audience. 
he knew the woman had touched his garment. And he turned to her, said, found her where she was. He didn't know at first that thy faith has saved thee. I want to ask some of you scholars. Is that same word, save, just the same as it is, salvation or healing? Same Greek word, sozo, is that right? He's saved physically or saved spiritually. Now believe in salvation. Your faith, sozo, saves you. Believe it? Oh, my. Have you real ever? And if God will do that, that any person in the audience... Will you believe? Just that you might see that it's God and not me. You just be praying and see if the Holy Spirit will. How many here will believe with all your heart if God was some person in there that I don't know will say the same thing like he did the woman at the well and tell what's your trouble or whatever it is or something other? You'll believe with all your heart from right here and you won't even have to be called in prayer. Will you do it? May he grant it. Now I want you just to Look to Calvary. Now he's a high priest of, of our confession. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Don't be straining. You, you get nervous. Just let loose. <laughs> Say, God, yes, that's right. Now, in the sovereign grace of God, the angel of the Lord is over the building right out there now. I am not a hypocrite. I'm not a fanatic. I'm only telling truth. Now, if he is, may he grant these things that I have asked. If the audience is watching me, I'm looking right at that same pillar of fire that you see on the picture right now. It's hanging over a woman, and over the woman is a dark shadow. I see her falling, frothing at the mouth. She's got her head down. She's sitting right back there. She has epileptic fits. She's sitting on the end of the row. She's praying for God to take it away from her. Raise up your hand, lady, and accept your healing. Will you do it back there? You believe that God will take away epilepsy and make you well? If you'll do it, believe it, you can have your healing. God will make you well. The Lord be with you, my sister. Aren't you loving? Just be reverent. You're in church. Keeps moving right through this aisle. He's standing over a lady which has a, a checkered dress on. She's got arthritis. There sits a man there. He's got high blood pressure looking at him. He's got a high striping elderly man. Do you believe, sir, that God will make you well? Yes, sir. Do you believe that he'll make you well? Just say praise the Lord. That's all I want you to do. All right, sir. God bless you. Go home now. You're healed. Be your reverend. Man and woman sitting together, a lady wiping your eyes. You had high blood pressure too. There's two of them together, so you were healed also. So don't fear no more. God bless you, lady. The little lady. That's right. You. See, that's you. I want you to say something, lady. You were praying, wasn't you? Is that right? You. Yes, ma'am. The little hat on you. Just raise your hand so the audience can see who you are. Right. That's the lady right there. You were praying. You're healed now. You believe? Right on down the road from you, there's a lady praying. She's got epilepsy. And she might know who it is. Her sister sits next to her, and she's a nervous woman. If that's right, you two women stand on your feet. If you're sisters, and stand on your feet. It's epilepsy and nerve. You believe? Have faith in God. Somebody over in here believe. What about down in here? Do you believe? 
have faith. A little lady sitting there with the white rose or white flower. God can heal arthritis and make well, can you, lady? <laughs> you believe it? Raise up. Stomp your feet up and down. Raise your feet up and down so you see it. Your arthritis, move your hands around. The Lord Jesus healed you then, made you well. <laughs> now, he's wonderful. Do you believe that? If thou canst believe. The lady sitting next to you, lay your hands on her. She's got throat trouble. She wants to be healed, too. Amen. That's right, isn't it, lady? Now, you can be healed also. Amen. Have faith in God. Now, I'm not reading your mind. Do you believe God is in the building? I want you to start praying just a minute. I'll look some other way if you think I'm reading your mind. Yes, I want someone to start praying now and just pray real sincerely. Just believe on the Lord Jesus and know that it's not me, it's Him. Oh God, that they might know that you're Christ and raised from the dead. That you're here. I see standing before me two. It's a man and a woman. And the man has something wrong with his spine. And the woman has a female trouble. And they're, the man's a minister. I've never seen him before. And he isn't from here. He's from Ohio. His first name is Frank. Greg is his last name. You believe that Jesus Christ makes you well now? Would you stand up? Glorify God? God bless you. Have faith in God. How many more wants to be healed? Put your hands over on one another. Ministers of the gospel, you take me by word tonight. Your people will be coming to you weeks after I'm gone telling you that their troubles are healed. It's just going from one to another, from one to another. It's right around the altar. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy sovereignty, for Thy blessings. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that You will come and minister and bless each one of these. And may the Holy Ghost Come upon this people just now and heal them each one. May your loving arms, may they realize that Jehovah Jireh is at the is at the line of duty tonight. The angels of God that's gone on pursuit after these demon powers that has that taken the people by force, that God has sent his angels, and they're here declaring the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Satan, you've lost the battle. Come out of these people. In the name of Jesus Christ, I adjure thee, my Lord. Please be Let's just all be very quiet in the service of